So, um, welcome. Um, so this is a Black History course, which is slated to run for 10 weeks. And the idea is to give a general outline of the experience of immigrants coming to Britain. And I want to, along the way, talk a bit about what I mean by black people, what I mean by immigrants, and the kind of things, period that we will cover. So, the first thing I should say is introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ken Olende. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I say a bit about my background, which is firstly that my uh, father's African and I grew up partly in Kenya, but mostly in London. My mother is English and have had a long interest in issues around uh, race and racism. I'm currently, I've for a long time worked as tutor for the Workers' Education Association, which people may or these days possibly may not have heard of. It's an organisation that organises um, talks and discussions on a number of issues. So what I want to do here is do an introductory talk. So this week I want to start by talking about the, what the course will do in general um, and then go on to look at what I'm calling early visitors. For people who know anything about this, I'm roughly talking about things up to the sort of Elizabethan period and the beginnings of the slave trade, um, because I think there's some interesting things that happened before that that uh, people tend not to be aware of. So, I suppose the thing to do is really just get started. I will... Um, I want to start with a picture which goes back beyond the time when um, people normally think of there being black presence in Britain. So this is a contemporary picture of the trumpeters, royal trumpeters in London, and one of them is a guy who is recorded as John Blank. He was a trumpeter for, in the court of both Henry VII and Henry VIII in the 1500s. We don't know very much about him. It's almost certain, for instance, that his name wasn't John Blank. That is a very typical joke because Blank simply means white. So if you have, to go back to an earlier version, a big guy, you call him Little John or something. And if you have a black person who's amongst white people, you call him John White. But he was a trumpeter for some time. And one of the things that I think is interesting about him I'm going to be discussing slavery in various ways, but one of the things that's interesting about him is he has not to have been a slave. He was a trumpeter um, alongside um, other, peop other people. So this is the kinds of interesting things I want to, to talk about. And I will just show... This is the my plan for the um, course. Um, I should say I have got here... Um, handouts, which I should give out, which have these details on and some other details about what we're going to talk about. I think that this shows something about the... that I'm trying to do it chronologically, but it does mean that the kinds of things we talk about from week to week will change quite dramatically. So the thing about early visitors, I suspect, is stuff that most people won't know very much about, um, and um, it will be sort of, wow, that's interesting, hopefully. Um, the next week I want to talk about the slave trade and more specifically how the campaign against the slave trade um, developed in Britain. Um, so we'll talk a bit about what the slave trade represented to this country, but also who the people who organised against it were, um, not just people like William Wilberforce, who most people will have heard of, uh, but also people like Aluda Equiano, who organised at a much um, lower level you know, amongst more ordinary people. I think it's very important to have a week discussing the British Empire, even if that means not really talking about um, immigration to Britain all that much, because, to pick on a slogan from when I was young, in the 80s there was a slogan which is, we're here because you were there. So when a racist came up to you and said, what are you doing in our country? You'd say, we're here because you were there. Because if Britain hadn't conquered large chunks of the world, it wouldn't have um, such a large immigrant population. And I think it's difficult to understand the history of immigration to Britain without understanding the British Empire. And as someone who's worked as a historian and things, one of the things that I find 
strangest to some extent about British history is the absence of the empire. Um, it was the biggest empire the world's ever seen. Until 1957, there was Empire Day every year and people talk about how wonderful the British Empire was. And now it's pretty much forgotten. People say, didn't we build railways and hospitals for people? But beyond that, it's not really taught. And I think there's reasons for that, which I would hope to, to discuss. Uh, but after that, she'll move into a much more formal thing about the period of post-war immigration. So it really, I'm trying to do pretty much a decade a week. So we have post-war immigration, which is really the period, the late 1940s and the 1950s, when what's often called mass immigration took off. There's a lot to be said about that because there were large periods of immigration from other places earlier than this, whether it was Jewish people coming from Eastern Europe or Irish people um, coming, but because this is a course on black history, we should be talking specifically about immigration from around at the beginning of the period, the empire, later on the Commonwealth, uh, to discuss how that happened. Um, and then she'll go through, I've actually put decades on, and sometimes I leave them out, but I think it's easier sometimes. So uh, 1960s growing communities and shifting responses, talking about what people did as they felt more established. The 1970s, they put resistance to racism. Uh, there's reasons why racism became a more solid issue in the 1970s. People may think, wasn't there a lot of racism in the 50s and 60s? Yes, there was, but I want to say reasons why I think it became more of an issue in the, uh, in the 1970s. The 1980s, I've called riots and compromise because in some ways they were some of the more confrontational scenes, a series of famous riots, most famously the Brixton riot, but mostly, well, not, I was going to say mostly around London. They weren't mostly around London. There were riots all over the country, but several of the best, best known ones were, uh, were around London. Uh, but there was also the emergence of not exactly a black establishment, but people who became better known. And since that, you have, I've called the 1990s established and mobile in that it's about social mobility, people moving around the country, people changing jobs and becoming established in that way. In the 2000s, just called new scares over immigration. That's rather simplifying 20 years of um, history, but certainly in the period over the past decade or so, there have been scares over immigration. And I want to have a last week summing up the whole history, hopefully so that people can come in with opinions that they've got on it and talking about what does this all mean for Britain today. So that's the plan um, if people want to stick for uh, 10 weeks. If you have friends and relatives who aren't sure about things, you can tell them that they can come for some of it because it would be nice to have a bigger group of people because I think the um, discussions work better if there's a few more people about with different ideas and different experiences coming in. And also, at this stage, if you want to say, why are you doing that? Why aren't you doing that? Um, do come in and you can say that right now or you can say it at the, later on in the session if it suddenly occurs to you to do so. I haven't mentioned uh, the picture here, which is a picture of some people from the West Indies. Uh, they're not on the Windrush. There's quite a lot of famous pictures of the Empire Windrush. For people who don't know, uh, the Empire Windrush was the first ship that people, I would say, privately came on from the Caribbean. It was one of many ships that travelled around the Empire moving people. This is before people were travelling by plane very much. And it happened to be coming back uh, from Jamaica and people who could afford the fare came initially, almost all men who could, came to get work and then families and so on followed. So this is a picture from later on. This is the SS Balmoral and it's docking in Southampton. Uh, and so this is a family getting off. One thing I would say about it is that there's Autograph, who are, uh, have a gallery down near Old Street, have a, a series of these photos that have been, I say unearthed, I don't think they were ever hidden, but they weren't particularly known. So there's some very beautiful photos that they've got in their exhibition. Uh, I think it's still going on. It was it started in July, so it would seem logical to have it. So if you get a chance, I would recommend going down there um, and um, seeing. It's called Journeys to Hope.
Right, so if anyone wants to ask anything about the course or anything, uh, now do, do do that. Otherwise, I shall go straight on to... Um, it's, as I, it's not my call, but as I understand it, um, I think if you come, you can pay for what, what you come to. You don't have to pay for, do you have to pay for the whole course if you, you do? Yeah, that's, that was the plan. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I'm really going to start this story with the Roman Empire, uh, and I'll explain why in a minute. This is the Roman Empire at its um, greatest expanse. So this is in the reign of the Emperor Trajan in the year 117 in the Common Era. Why I wanted a map was to show the extent of the empire. It was primarily a Mediterranean empire. So many emperors at the time, it was round the Mediterranean and it ventured down a bit into Egypt, which had conquered, a bit across into Babylon and areas like that, and then up across much of Europe, including Britain at the top. Why this is important is, uh, well, what, in, for, for this story, um, I will we'll come back to. But I do want to um, say, start by saying just a general thing um, about... Uh, immigration um, in that often there's a I suppose the conversation around immigration tends to say there are people who live somewhere and they're the population and then there are another group of people who move and they're migrants or immigrants and there's definitely a feeling in the way things are discussed at the moment that they're a lesser sort of people who tend to try and be undermining uh, the established community um, and taking quite a political stance on this that I absolutely disagree with that position and I think that um, one of the things that's interesting about human history is it's a lot of it is a history of mobility of people moving about of different groups of people moving for different reasons sometimes because they wanted to sometimes for economic reasons because they felt life wasn't good where they were and it would be better somewhere else sometimes fleeing persecution and sometimes because they were kidnapped and moved against their will. So all those different um, reasons uh, come up at different times. Also, the way people are classified depends, varies an awful lot. So for instance, to take to modern terminology, I will get back to the Roman Empire in a minute, the difference between migrants who are people who come over here to take our benefits, often when you read about it in the papers, and um, I've now forgotten the term. Uh, when your son is a doctor who goes and works in America or in Dubai or somewhere, they are not a migrant. Well, they are a migrant, but that's not the term that's used in the press. Um, expat is exactly, I'm sorry. I just have a, how you view these things uh, varies enormously. How you view whether someone belongs or not varies on how you define uh, your society. Um, so, for instance, uh, at the height of the British Empire, you could be a British person and part of the ruling group, even if you were born in India and had never really spent any time in, in Britain. There have been societies where you can live for generations and generations in a place and not be considered as part of that society, always be seen as an outsider. There are societies where you are considered part of that society, but always um, at a certain level. For instance, um, people of African descent in the United States um, have always been considered part of that society, but usually have been considered second-class citizens who would never be able to rise uh, to the top of that society. So these things are all really mobile, uh, and they're things we might discuss why they're like that. When people look back at the Roman Empire, they often think of it as a place which was run 
by a bunch of Italians from Rome who went out, conquered, um, well, all that, um, and then defended it for a while until they were overrun by barbarians, um, and then it finished. Um, I think it's rather more complicated than that. One of the things that's interesting for me about the Roman Empire is that they had an idea of citizenship um, which allowed people from different parts of the empire to reach um, high, high roles within it. So some of the emperors uh, were not born in Italy and were not from Italian families. Uh, in fact, they didn't really have a concept of Italy as such, uh, uh, from Rome or from the, the people around Rome. Um, and it was, uh, we should come on to um, emperors who came from North Africa and people who were engaged with the empire who came from further afield. So, for instance, even though the expansion eastwards uh, across Europe stopped at the Rhine, people in what is now Germany who were independent still had economic ties with um, what was going on in the Roman Empire. If you look at the British Isles, it's quite difficult to talk about who exactly was where at what time, but before the Romans arrived, you can roughly call the people who were here Celts, um, and they had dealings, you know, that if you can find Roman coins and things from before the Romans arrived. The Romans arrived twice for people who don't know. They had conquered um, sections of England in uh, oh God, I've 55 BC, I think it is, um, under Julius Caesar, and then had some troubles elsewhere and withdrew their armies um, and then came back uh, in 43 in the Common Era. Uh, for people, depending on when you've um, been at school or have looked at history, you should say that um, traditionally in Western um, historical writings, people talk about AD and BC, which stood for before Christ and Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. Um, modern historians don't want to use a, such a Christian uh, way of um, analysing things, so it's now common to talk about um, common era and before common era. So it's the same dates, but with a slightly different, he different heading. So when I put things up, um, they will, I, for instance, put on this slide uh, CE for Common Era. Um, but if you get confused by that, it's for in the older system, it's AD. Um, anyway, so yes, the Romans arrived in Britain um, and one of the ways that they tended to work was to bring the local rulers in and have some way of working with local, local people. Um, I should say, sometimes we'll compare the way, for instance, the Roman Empire worked with ways the British Empire worked and say the Romans weren't racist, which I think is true. I don't think the Romans were racist. Um, and therefore, it can make the Romans seem, uh, well, they were, it was a nicer, friendlier sort of empire. I don't really want to give that impression um, it's difficult when I'm just touching on the Roman Empire to talk about it. At, on some levels, it was a very brutal empire. It was an empire that lived on slavery. It was an empire uh, where, you remember, this is, this is the place where slaves were fought to death in the gladiatorial games and where the way that it expanded was by having a very efficient and very brutal army. You might say that's typical of most empires, but nonetheless, um, if I'm saying nice things about Rome, um, and one of the things I want to say about is why it was a very cosmopolitan empire where people moved about a lot. So you would find people from different bits of the area, uh, empire in other bits of the empire, which is one of the things which is going to be the point I'm finally going to make when I get past this about what kind of people were living in um, Britain. Um, and the name Britain was given to these islands by the Romans, it's Britannia. Um, which is, um, was the name of the bit that they, uh, that they controlled, um, which is the bit up to, but not including Scotland. Um, so, the point of this, I'm not going to try and do a history of the Roman Empire, but to say one thing, they had a, a problem with power at some points, weren't you? Once you had the emperor controlling things, how you became emperor and how you took over was quite a big issue, um, and often, the way you became 
a figure of importance was by conquering places. Sir Julius Caesar, for instance, who came and conquered um, Britain amongst other places. And then you had the respect of the army that you'd used to conquer places. You also incidentally, as well as being nice to people sometimes, um, gave strips of land to the troops. So, in fact, the term colonialism comes from the colones, which were the strips of land that were given to the troops who were part of conquering armies. So if you arrived and conquered bits of um, Britain, uh, the chances are you would then be given some land. So as you, as a soldier, you then had a stake in the empire. Um, this kind of contradicted the let's be nice to the local people if you're also giving away their land to your troops. But, um, but that's another story. Um, what it did mean was that people built up power bases so that if you were a general who'd conquered Gaul and you had your troops who you'd given land to, if you then decided that you wanted to march on Rome and say, I want to be emperor, um, you would then in a, in a position where you had quite a strong force and you probably got battle-hardened troops. Uh, as a response to this, emperors started moving troops about. So you'd leave them five years in one bit and then you'd move some of them somewhere else at the other end of the empire. The idea being that they wouldn't build up, uh, no one would build up a power base in any one place. But what that meant was that you would have troops from one end of the empire stationed at the other end. Uh, not surprisingly, people would get attachments, get married, all these sorts of things, and then they would take their wives or whatever with them. So you had people moving around the empire much more than in some other empires that, it, that existed. Um, so that's how the Roman Empire um, was working um, in, its, um, in its early days. So in terms of thinking about these people moving about uh, and what kind of people they were, um, this... Um, when the, the furthest, well, the, the Romans moved up um, into, when, it, when they realised that it was going to be difficult to, co to conquer Scotland, and this is not a story I'm going into at all, um, they decided that the easiest way to deal with this was to build a wall. Uh, so they built a wall across the end of the Roman Empire, which we now know as Hadrian's Wall. They got soldiers to guard the wall to make sure that um, people from Scotland didn't invade. Um, so, on the wall, there is this. This is known as the Beaumont um, inscription. Um, and it was found, Beaumont is near Carlisle, and it says, from the prefect of numer numerous of Aurelian Moors at Abalava. Um, so it's saying it's a memorial and it's saying it was put up by this group of Moors. Now, Moors means people from North Africa. Um, in fact, it was used as a more general term for all Africans at various points. Um, so the unit that put it up was probably uh, from Mauritania, which is actually not in modern Mauritania, but in modern Morocco. Um, and they were gathered by the empty emperor um, Septimius Severus, about whom I'll say more in a minute. Um, and they were living in Britain in the second or third centuries. So the interesting thing about them uh, and about this record is this is the first definite record of Africans being in Britain um, in British history. Um, and they were troops in the Roman army. So that's what we know about them. Uh, we know quite a lot about different bits of uh, Roman history in, in, in Britain. Unfortunately, the, where you might in Rome have big archives and things going back, so you've got records. Uh, the, in London, the um, Roman records were destroyed at some point, so we haven't actually got the bureaucratic records. Anyway, as I say, that's not really the story that I want to, to go through at the moment. But I do want to say something about Moorish troops. Um, not all Roman troops throughout the empire were brought up within the empire. So there would be, for instance, at various times, Germanic troops who were brought in and uh, hired. I mean, this is not unusual in the history of empires where the British Empire has been quite happily used Gurkha troops and so on to, um, uh, to fight for it. But the Moorish troops, um, I think, are interesting. Now, Trajan, if you remember the map I showed showing the, the um, 
size of the Roman Empire at its greatest. That was under the Emperor Trajan. Um, for people who are interested in uh, history, that Britain was conquered under the Emperor Claudius, who um, there was a series of dramas, books about, which were turned into BBC dramas that have just been repeated. Um, but if you didn't see that, don't worry about it. But I like this. this Trajan was very proud of how big he'd made the empire. And he had a column put up, which is in Rome, known as Trajan's Column. So it's a massive column, and it has a great spiral story going round it, like a comic strip, of his victories. It's mostly showed, it's showing people trips, giving him tribute, armies marching on places, and so on. If you don't have time to go to Rome, uh, there is a plaster cast of it um, in the Victoria and Albert Museum. There's a casts gallery in the back. Um, and along the way, you come across this. Well, I've looked and I can't find this because it's actually quite hard to see on this, this thing going round and round and up exactly where this is. But what you have is this is a Moorish cavalry. Um, they are under Lucius Quietus and these are in Palestine. So they're not in Britain at all. However, because we've already met Moorish troops in, uh, in Britain, uh, I thought it was legitimate to include them. I think they're interesting because, well, among other things, they've got dreadlocks. Um, so they're riding as part of the Roman Empire with their dreadlocks and were um, considered uh, just a part of the Roman army. Um, the reason I wanted to, to show this is that they're when it talks, say, that there were Africans in Roman Britain and people of African descent, sometimes people will say, yeah, but they weren't really Africans, were they? They were North Africans or just people from the, the coast. They weren't black. They weren't sub-Saharan Africans. Uh, and so this is not really the case. There were people who, if you looked at them today, would be regarded as black um, and... There were people from, from, from all sorts of, of different backgrounds, but that's why I wanted to include uh, this picture because it gives an idea of the, one of the sorts of, some of the sorts of people um, who, uh, who there were as part, as part of the empire. Um, now, I mentioned that the time that the Moors were definitely in Britain, um, they were brought by an emperor called Septimius Severus. Oh, I've gone the wrong way. This is um, uh, a picture of Septimius Severus and his family. Um, now, Septimius, it's unfortunate that his face has been um, worn away, uh, whereas others in the family haven't. But um, he was um, emperor. He was from North Africa. Um, and he was what is sometimes called, uh, from his background was what is sometimes called Berber um, now. So he was, again, if you're getting into the intricacies of race, you might decide to say he was black, you might decide to say he wasn't black, but I would say, to put it another way, he wasn't white either. Um, and this was not considered a big issue um, at the time. Um, if you think about... Rome's history, and again, I haven't got a lot of time to, to think about it in particular, but if you think about the history of the, um, of the empire, for a long time its biggest enemy was another empire on the Mediterranean, which was the empire of Carthage, um, which was in North Africa. So someone, um, so once Rome con conquered Carthage's empire and incorporated it, um, people from the rulers of Carthage became incorporated into, into the empire. So it was not odd to see people from these kinds of African backgrounds brought in. Um, we'll just diverge again. People have asked, was there this, this uh, um, an attempt to deface, to destroy the emperor's face? Not as far as I know. I'm not saying it definitely wasn't, but... Um, I think it's just a, a fresco that's got damaged over time. Um, but I think it's whatever, it's interesting to see um, what kind of figure he was. And I want to say something about 
the kinds of people who, and what kinds of roles they had within the empire. Um, so, this is Roman Carthage. Uh, it's another uh, mosaic. Um, and it's uh, some slaves with their owner. Um, most families, rich families, would have had um, slaves. Um, and enslaved people came from all over the empire. It, there was, it wasn't that there was one group of people who were um, to be enslaved and others who weren't. On the whole, if you were conquered in a war, there was much, it was much more likely that you would be sold into slavery. You could buy your way out of slavery. And slavery was not the thing that was, it involved a lot of hard, boring manual work, but it could involve other things as well. A lot of um, teachers, for instance, there were enslaved Greek teachers who would be experts on, um, on things. So again, not saying that slavery was all right in the Roman Empire. Uh, your uh, master had absolute rights over you. Um, this meant that they could on occasion kill you. It meant that if you were um, a woman, you could be used sexually by your uh, master and so on. So it's not that it was okay, but it is that it was rather different from other um, sorts of um, enslavement that we see at different, um, at different periods. Um, and the reason I'm emphasizing this, not particularly talking about race to start with, is because I've already mentioned that I don't think Rome was a racist empire. Um, it was an empire based on brutal rule by a ruling elite. It was an empire based on power and the sword and a very uh, great deal of might. But it didn't class people by the colour of their skin. Um, so this is a woman known as um, Beachy Head Lady. Now, archaeologists have been looking at Roman sites, well, for hundreds of years, um, and they've found all sorts of artefacts. And in Britain, they've dug up, well, bodies, uh, well, mostly skeletons, and looked at them. And many of them were dug up, oh, you know, in the 19th century or so. However, once you get to the 20th century um, and better scientific understanding of how bones work and so on, it became possible to work out the origins of people. Um, and so, Beachy Head Lady is um, an upper class burial. And um, so people were surprised, I'd say, to discover that her background um, looks like she was um, at least in part sub-Saharan African. I mean, one of the uh, issues, if you already said, with the Roman Empire was it tended to be quite cosmopolitan in a way that, I don't want to make over comparisons, but you could compare to modern Britain or something that people from different backgrounds intermarried. So um, it wasn't necessarily that you would have a black African family. It might be an officer who'd been stationed in um, Africa, or it might be an African officer who'd come to Britain. Um, I don't know. But this was, on the whole, the burials where we've got neatly, um, you know, buried people with their belongings tend to be rich people. Uh, poor people didn't have those kinds of bra uh, graves. So it was um, rich people, and I think it's interesting uh, that someone like, um, like this was buried there. And this is not a total aberration. I don't know what this, this is another grave. This is actually, um, that was a reconstruction. This is what they actually found in this other grave. Um, the grave goods include some jewelry, um, a jug, and a series of um, obviously the skeleton, and uh, a series of bangles. Uh, the bangles are interestingly, um, from a historical point of view, made of ivory, 
and Jet. Now, Jet is um, a black, ooh, I'm going to risk saying stone. I think it's a stone that you get in um, the north of England and it's dug up around places like Whitby and so on. Um, ivory comes from elephant tusks and therefore tends to come from places like Africa. Um, so it was just interesting to see that she was buried with this mixture of uh, things. She was discovered um, a long time ago. This was in the area of York and um, became known as the Ivory Bangle Lady. You might see a pattern to some of these, these names. Um, again, with more modern examinations, they looked at um, where, you know, racially, I don't like the term racially, but ethnically, I suppose, where she um, may originally have come from. Um, and... Yes, I'm, having already talked about Beachy Head Lady, I'm not going to try and surprise you. And so this is, so it turned out again that her background was African. Um, and this is her skeleton and those things are in um, the uh, Yorkshire Museum. And this is a painting which comes from that exhibition. Um, but it's an attempt to imagine what her funeral would have been like. And the point I think they're trying to make here is that you have a mixture of people from different parts of the empire who are um, coming together and whether there was a significant point being made by mixing jewellery that was made in the north of England and jewellery from Africa or made out of a product from Africa, I don't know, but um, it's interesting to speculate. Okay, I want to have a quick um, glass of water. So I'll ask if anyone wants to say anything or has any comments about anything I've said about the Roman Empire because Clue, I'm about to abandon the Roman Empire and uh, skip off into other bits of history. I, sorry if I missed it, but so the, so the ivory bangle lady and then the beachy head skull, was it, or lady as well? Uh, they were both um, skeletons. Yeah. Of the family, yeah. <laughs> um, when when are they dated to? Are they similar times or do they...? Um, they're um, at the sort of, I would say, peak of the Roman Empire. So between two and three hundred, years two and three hundred, roughly that sort of period. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. So, yeah. It's just a, uh, a comment, I suppose. Um, so the, the concept of slavery uh, pre-nation states like, for instance, in the Ottoman Empire as well, wasn't obviously based on uh, race. And, I mean, not just, um, not just the, that it wasn't based on race, it's the, the slavery, I mean, the Ottoman Empire slaves, for instance, they could uh, go in high ranks and become mm -hmm. diplomats. And so, I mean, it's, the concept is, a, although we both call it slavery, don't we? But yes. it's, a, it's a kind of a different um, context uh, before, uh, I don't know if you can separate it before the nation states or after. I don't know if you mm -hmm. have any comments on that. Um, to some extent, what I'm trying to do here is preparatory to talking about more modern slavery. Um, to, to suggest different ideas of how um, slavery was organised. One of the things about most of the empires that we talked about, the Ottoman Empire included, um, is that they had no idea or were not based on any idea of human equality. Um, so while the Roman Empire wasn't based on ideas of racial superiority, certainly the people who ran it um, thought that they were superior sorts of people and that superior sorts of people ought to run the empire. Now, as I've said, they picked people from around the empire um, and so it wasn't that they thought that people from Italy were inherently superior. Um, they believed that there were superior people around the place in, in different ways. They also believed that sometimes people 
might be superior in some ways or other ways. So people who were born to rule were not necessarily the best intellectuals, were not necessarily the best planners. Um, and actually, I think it's interesting that the, um, in the Ottoman Empire, um, often you had military leaders who were um, from enslaved backgrounds and were often still enslaved. Um, as I've mentioned, in the Roman leader you, in empire, you often had intellectuals who were enslaved. So it becomes complicated to people who are used to ideas of racial slavery and the idea that the intellectually superior people are the people who rule uh, to look at some of the slightly more complicated systems that worked in the past. But I will try and come back to that in, in um, future weeks, partly because one of the things about various African societies, and you will say that there, in the period of the slave trade, there was not one sort of African society. There were a whole series of different sorts of African societies. But in these periods, many of them had forms of slavery, but they were, as Banu has mentioned, very different from what is seen as slavery um, or what slavery became in the uh, uh, period of the Atlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. Um, it was, it was the, the question there was, was it based on education? Well, not really, because, I mean, at one level it was based on physical dominance. So if you were conquered, there was a fair chance you would be made into a slave. But what you would do as a slave depended on um, other factors. Now, I think the majority of slaves were either household servants, like the ones in the picture I showed before, and an awful lot of them were people who worked farms. That was how a lot of the Roman economy worked, was the aristocracy owned farms and they didn't work them, they got people to work on them. Um, again, there were issues within the system in that um, if you remember the colonizers often who were the troops who'd spent years in the army would then set up a, a small holding and um, would want to farm and export stuff around the empire. They would then be in competition with large farms that were owned by members of the aristocracy. Um, I don't want to make too much of a direct comparison, but if you think about America in the 19th century, when you had an idea where you had the, the big plantations that were um, where the work was all done by enslaved people, and on the other hand, the idea of the American dream being that you bought your house and a plot of land and you farmed it, and therefore you made yourself part of society. But it's very difficult to do that if you're being undercut by enslaved people being worked to death over on the other side. This was, um, so that kind of tension can exist. I'm not suggesting that the economic dynamic between the American period and the Roman was the same, but some of the emotional thing might well have been the same. Yes, come. So, I mean, obviously this is a way before the modern period, you know, thousands of years before the modern period. So would you describe, I mean, without the absence of racism, would you describe us as a plebeian society? more um, than a, uh, a society based on, on identi ethnic identity? I would say it was, a, if you like, a multi-ethnic society, but one that was based on an idea of a stable empire. This may sound, I'm not, not being facetious or anything, I think that the, the, by the time of its peak, the Roman Empire's point was to keep the Roman Empire going. Um, in its early years, it did that by loot. You know, you just kept expanding and conquering people. But by the time you're building Hadrian's Wall and all this, they'd stopped expanding, they'd stopped conquering people, and they were moving to internally running things on a slave economy. So you had lots of people in the cities who were not... If you look at modern societies, they're run by 
the people in the cities. You know, people go out to work, they do things, they make money for the society. For a lot of the people, for the Roman period, the money was made by people in the countryside. Um, so a lot of the people in the cities were unemployed a lot of the time. This is where the bread and circuses things come. If you hear that, they say, what are we to do to keep the ordinary people, the plebs in the city quiet? We have to give them something. So they were given free bread and circuses to entertain them and this kind of thing. Uh, again, this is not the whole story, but I'm trying to simplify it slightly to, um, to give an idea um, of, of, of what's, um, what's going on. Um, I would like to move on a bit, not because I want to stop talking about this, but because the next bit has some of this in as well. So. The Roman Empire, um, often people have an idea that at about 500, the year 500, um, barbarians came in, they conquered it, Rome fell, and that was the end of things. Um, it is worth saying that firstly, that for complicated reasons, the Roman Empire split in two. Um, so there was one side that was run from Rome and the other side was run from uh, Constantinople. Uh, the Constantinople side kept going until the 1470s, so, uh, and as, as it was known as the Byzantine Empire. Um, so when people say the Roman Empire fell in about 500, people from that side say they got a bit annoyed about that and said, we were still here for a thousand years after that. Um, but, um, the side that was in Rome, while the empire fell, and what happened, for instance, as far as Britain was concerned, was that there was a crisis in Rome, so the legions, the troops, were withdrawn, um, and that led to a, a collapse of society, which I shall um, mention in a bit. But um, it didn't mean, incidentally, that all the Roman people left. There's sometimes an idea that when I talk about an invasion, like when the Romans arrived, that means that all the people who were there were either put to the sword or dumped into the sea or just pushed further along and they left. Actually what happened is the majority of people probably stayed and were ruled over by different people. So it's not the case that everyone is always massacred every time you see uh, a, a takeover. Though again, I don't want to give a sort of pacifist version and suggest that it wasn't the case that some people were massacred when uh, a new ruling group took over. Anyway, the Romans left, or the Roman rulers left, um, and you saw a period of relative um, chaos. One of the things that people find is that where Rome had become a very urban society, where you had administration in cities, people tended to go back to hill forts and things because there were what we would call warlords these days running about and controlling things. And where people had the money, they often would pay for either warlords or mercenaries to come and protect them. And this may well have been why, for instance, the Anglo-Saxons arrived. Now, the Anglo-Saxons, who people often talk about England as an Anglo-Saxon country, it's actually different groups of people, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes, I don't know why the Jutes get left out of this, um, who came and came from what's now Germany and tended to settle in the east side of the, of the country. Uh, so East Anglia is the East Angles uh, and so on. And you saw them moving across the country. So the bits that are controlled by Britons um, tend to be the people in the West. Now, this is why I was going on about it's not the case. It's not the case that all the people in the red bits there in the East are Anglo-Saxons and are completely new sort of people, and that all the people who lived in that side are pushed out. Um, it, it's partly who's ruling them, and it affa affects the, uh, the language. Um, just as a historical marker, by the time the Romans left, um, Britain was a Christian country because the Roman Empire was Christian. Um, the Anglo-Saxons were not Christian, so when they took over, 
people went back to um, non-Christian gods, often the, uh, well, a number of gods, but there were, some of them were like the gods that the Vikings uh, would later um, talk about. Again, I don't want to get tied up in that. It's the idea of immigration is what I'm interested in here. The people who are marked as Britons on this map, so this is about the year 600, would be what we might call Romano-Britons. So some of them would be from areas that the Romans never really conquered. Others would be people who had been part of the Roman Empire, would consider themselves Roman. Um, and others would be, have different ideas. So everything gets a bit chaotic, I suppose. Um, but it's an interesting thing. And I just want to say, this is nothing really to do with black people, but to do with the ideas of immigration. If you think about who, I don't know if people do this in school anymore, but who the um, great British heroes are, you can normally think of, um, I think, Boudicca, or Bodicea, as she's sometimes known, who fought the Romans. There's King Arthur um, and King Alfred. Um, each of them are put on as, as British heroes or English heroes. But who were they? Um, Boudicca was a queen uh, from East Anglia. She was uh, one of the Celtic peoples. Um, her, she was one of the groups of people. She was a ruling queen um, and she, her group of people had done a deal with the Romans and were told that they could keep their lands. Uh, the Romans reneged on the deal and um, her, it was her husband who was a king rose up um, and was killed. She became the leader and led a rebellion. So she was leading a rebellion of Celtic people, the Iceni, um, against the Roman invasion. There's arguments about whether King Arthur existed, but if he did exist, um, he would have been a Romano Briton. So he would have been active in this period. So he would have been with the Britons over here, fighting the Anglo-Saxons as they arrived. So trying to defend what he would have seen as Roman civilization. King Alfred was an Anglo-Saxon. Um, so he's several, a couple of hundred years later, and he would have been, well, no, King Alfred definitely existed. We've got records of him and this sort of thing. But he was fighting the Vikings who came from Scandinavia uh, and took most of Northumbria, most of what's the north of Britain there. So the point of this is each of these people who is a great British hero is actually someone from the immigrant group which was being fought against previously. Um, so my only point here is it's all a bit complicated. <laughs> so let's go. Oh, no. Also, we just find things out occasionally. So um, in... East, where was this? Near Ipswich, which is in East Anglia, um, there was um, a, a friary, so a religious, um, Christian religious building, had a graveyard. Archaeologists have dug up the graveyard and found this is in the bones of an African man. Um, and they found out of 150 people in that graveyard, nine of them were from an African background. And that's it. I mean, you know, I would like to say, and I'll tell you the interesting story about how they got there. I've no idea what the interesting story about how they've got there is. It is just interesting that they are there from that sort of period. So this is slightly later than that chaotic map that is showed, but um, somehow people from African backgrounds were still travelling to, uh, to Britain at that period. Um, I'm not saying many of them were. It, this may have been the only nine who travelled, but that's unlikely. So you start seeing that we're in a period where even though long-range travel stops a great deal after the Roman Empire, after, I mean, the period the, called the, you know, the Pax Romana allowed people to travel long distances across the empire, but even afterwards it was still possible. And incidentally, it's likely that the um, black citizens of the Roman Empire didn't all head off back to Rome or Africa. They will have stayed and will have descendants who are still in, in Britain to this day. Um, 
That was, um, oh, so this is slightly later. Oh, this is, it is actually later. I should have put that in. That's from the 13th century. So, um, so this is slightly going back. Oh, no. It's back slightly earlier. Um, but it's an interesting story because it's coming back about slavery. Um, there's a lot of interesting things about this story, about why it's uh, remembered. Pope Gregory um, was in Rome, was walking apparently through the slave market. So there is a slave market in, in Rome. Um, and he looks at some boys who are on sale um, and says, what are they? Um, and his assistant says, oh, they're angles. Um, and he made a famous comment, which is, uh, they're not angles, they're angels. Um, which is a joke in Latin, non, non angeli sit. Because angles and angels look the same. Anyway, um, and this inspired him to try and win England back to Christianity. Um, so this is a story. So this, for instance, this image is from the Catholic um, cathedral in London. So it was put up in the 19th century when this um, idea of, oh yes, non angli sed angeli, said the Pope, not, an, not angles but angels. Um, now, I don't know if people want to discuss this, what the Pope was doing in the slave market. I'm sure the Pope had slaves. Why he was looking at um, boys in the slave market why he thought that it was a good joke to say they weren't angles but angels. Um, any of these things are interesting questions that raise a conversation. Nonetheless, he did send back, um, well, St. Augustine was sent and did convert um, England back to, um, to Christianity. Over time, he went back to try and convert the Roman areas, so the bishop should be the, the archbishop should be the Archbishop of London, but he couldn't actually get as far as London, so he had to stop in Canterbury where he converted that, and that's why Canterbury became the head of the English church. Anyway, this is nothing much to do with race, but it's got to do with slavery. That it was the question he asked was not why are there white English people on sale in the um, slave market? It was oh, they're very attractive white English people and we should do something about it. So it was the idea that one sort of people were sold in a slave market and not other sorts of people was not something that occurred to him. Um, and incidentally, in terms of later interactions between the church and slavery, um, at this period, there was nothing seen as being particularly odd about there being um, slaves. Slavery had stopped being the main way of running society after the Roman Empire. Um, the de we developed feudalism, and I'm not going to try and go into much feudalism. That was just a thing where local lords had the serfs who worked in their area who were not quite slaves, but on the other hand, weren't free and couldn't, uh, couldn't leave. And that was the, the main way that society was run. And it was a much less mobile society. Most people in England would have been very ignorant about other groups of people. And I'm starting to shift here just to think about what people thought about people from other places um, or people who looked different from them. I don't know everything about what Romans thought but as I hope I've shown, the ideas in Rome were quite fluid. So there were quite a lot of people moving about. So it's quite likely, I don't know what happened if you lived on a small farm in East Anglia, but if you lived in London or York, you would see people from around the empire. You would have uh, those kinds of views of, of what people look like. Things changed in the period in the later period, in the medieval period. Um, I should say that this is, sometimes people talk as if this is the world that has changed, that all around the world, everything went backwards and no one moved about. It's not really the case. Um, the period when we're looking at the 11th, 12th centuries, the period which is the medieval, beginning, early medieval period in Britain and Northern Europe, 
um, is also the period of uh, great Arab expansion around the Mediterranean, when you have scientists and so on developing ideas there. It's periods when there's various things going on in India, in China, also in various bits of South America. But in Europe, that's what's going on. And the ideas that go with that are strange. So this is, this is quite late. This is 1544, so several hundred years later. Uh, it was still possible to have a book um, about the world. This is from a book published in Germany uh, called Cosmographia, uh, talking about strange people who exist in other parts of the world. Uh, and this book included um, two-headed people, people with dog-headed people, uh, people with one eye, uh, people with their face on their chests, and people who had one leg uh, who lived in hot countries and had a giant foot which they would use as an umbrella. Um, now, how seriously these ideas were taken, I'm not sure, but certainly in terms of people who lived in bits of um, Europe, who didn't see people from other places, it was possible to believe all sorts of things about the kinds of people that you might come across. Uh, and the reason I'm talking about this is because it meant that there were some very contradictory ideas about what people in other bits of the world were like and what they did. Contradictory because people knew certain things about different bits of the world. So this is um, from a medieval atlas the Catalan Atlas. It was put together in, um, well, Catalonia in, um, the, uh, th in 1375. And it was large, I've zoomed in on a picture. The lines are in some way more important as an atlas. Uh, the African coast is just off the, um, off the side there. It's cropped off because the practical bit was to show you how to sail down the coast. But it, as with many old maps, it would say these, there's interesting things. So an interesting thing is the fact that the richest man in the world lives in inland here. And his name is Mansa Musa, um, and that's their image of him. And given what they knew about him, it's pretty good. Um, he was a king, he was black, he ruled the Malian Empire, as it happens. Um, and the reason uh, he was very rich and had a lot of gold was we controlled the um, caravan routes across the Sahara, um, which were largely trading in gold and uh, salt at this time. Uh, there were also there was also a trade in slaves, which I should um, mention, but it wasn't the main thing that, that he was interested in. So, in Europe, it was quite possible to say the richest man in the world is a king like this in Africa, and from what is part of modern Spain, having been ruled for several hundred years by um, people from um, African backgrounds, possibly the idea that that is not a strange thing is not so odd. Um, but I wanted to bring up some of the contradictions of uh, medieval society. So here is, a, again, a thing from Magdeburg in modern Germany. Um, of St. Morris, um, who was one of the Christian saints who tended to be presented as an African, as he is in this, uh, in this statue. So this is a holy statue in a cathedral um, representing someone who should be looked up to. Um, and he was known, I mean, I don't know how much he's known in Britain, but if, if you think about France, um, St. Moritz is named after St. Morris uh, and so on. So at the one hand, there wasn't an idea that all black people are in any way inferior. On the other hand, there was a tendency to talk about good and evil in terms of black and white, quite literally. So pure white is a pure color and black or dark is an impure color. Um, so this picture of a demon um, scourging Christ um, has him as a dark figure. So on, so this, I mean, people might want to say something about this. I, I don't think it's resolved. I think in the medieval mind, it was possible to have certain prejudices that could be built on that could go against African people or people with darker skins, but not necessarily. <laughs>
Um, and that is really all I'm going to say, except I want to bring on two things. I'm going to bring into a new period. This period, as you may have noticed, is basically speculative. Um, we know quite a lot about what was going on in the Roman Empire. We know a bit about some other bits. In terms of immigrants in England in the um, medieval period, you may have noticed that a lot of these pictures are not from England, they're from um, Germany and places. And I just wanted to get an idea about what the kind of mindset of people was because, um, because I want to go on to something else. Yes, David, want to? <coughs> Yes. Um, I mean, I think that, again, it's uh, a contradictory idea because, on the one hand, the, um, the Crusades were against, the, but against darker people, but they were also against heathens. So it was often seen as, we are going to save the local people there who are Christian from the heathens who have taken over. Um, and a myth that was, is interesting, uh, but I haven't really got time to go into, is that of Prester John. Um, as the Crusaders advanced towards Jerusalem and the Holy Land and found that on the whole they were outclassed by the um, Saracens that they were fighting and eventually would be defeated by Saladin, um, they had an idea that over there, beyond the um, people they were fighting, was a Christian king. Uh, called, who they called Prester John. Um, and if only they could get through to him, they could make a united front and fight and, uh, and beat uh, the heathens. Um, th this becomes an interesting story later on when they discover Ethiopia and wonder whether the Ethiopians are Prester John or not. But, um, but, the, but the, this was often seen as a black king. So it was, again, it's contradictory that... I do think that, you know, when people thought the evil enemy are Saracen and heathens and they tend to be dark, I'm quite sure that when people, you know, this is when you start seeing the beginning of the pubs in Britain called the Saracen's Head and stuff. And I bet that a lot of the pub signs that they would have put up if they had illustrations on would have been very nasty. Um, so, yes, I can see that there would have been a prejudice in that, but not, not fully developed. That's, that's what I think, that, that because the Allies were also supposed to be um, dark. And it's interesting, if you look at the Crusades, they're very strange. So one of the, there were three Crusades, and one of them, um, on the way, sacked Constantinople, which was one of the great Christian cities that were supposed to be defending uh, Europe against the heathens. Uh, they certainly sacked Jerusalem and killed everyone they found there, including local Christians and Jews, because they saw them, they thought, oh, we've arrived at the home of the, the enemy. So it's, it's a bit of a mess, is all I would say for, for that. But, but certainly, one of the reasons I wanted to bring up here is, when I'm saying that this is not a period where things are defi defined by race, because I think until this period it really isn't, on the other hand, that doesn't mean that there aren't ideas building and stirring which can relate to race. And while, for instance, I think this guy in the red on the right here is not a black man who is attacking a white Jesus, on the other hand, if you looked at him in the right way, you could see him as a black man who's attacking a, um, a white Jesus. So, um, yes, so I think you're right. There are, uh, there are issues there that... Um, that we could that that will raise things, and this is where I really want to draw things to a close by arriving in the court of Queen Elizabeth I. Britain has changed quite a lot. If you remember, I started in um, Henry the Seventh and Henry the Eighth. This is the beginning of the Tudor period. Britain is going out from becoming a fairly minor island off the north coast of Europe and starting to become a more important trading nation and somewhere that can, a country that can fight against Spain and is starting to become a, a naval power. Um, 
at this time, um, and particularly under the um, reign of Queen Elizabeth, where Britain is also becoming a leading Protestant power, and I'm not going to go into the religious wars at the moment, um, things start changing. And there's something that I think is interesting. People may have heard of Queen Elizabeth's famous letter about blackamoors. Uh, blackamoors was a, a general term for um, Africans at the time, which could and often was used as a term of abuse. Um, I, I would ignore the top where I've put the actual letter. Um, what I've done is a translation into modern English of it, which I shall read out. Uh, this, so this is written officially by the Queen. I don't suppose she actually wrote it, but, you know, it's um, from the, the court. It says, an open letter to the Lord Mayor of London, his brethren and the aldermen, and to all other mayors and sheriffs, so to people in authority. Um, Her Majesty understands that recently a number of black people have been brought into the country, but there are already too many of this kind of people here, considering how God has blessed this land with as great an increase in the people of our own nation as any country in the world, and many of these, for lack of jobs or means to set them to work, live in idleness and poverty. Um, so that's the problem. the problem, as she sees it. Um, and her solution is that she has given someone this letter and says that they should be allowed to round up the black people and chuck them out of the country. Um, Edward Baines, uh, he's been, well, he's been instructed, the black people in this case is he's been instructed to take 10 black people um, who were brought by Sir Thomas Baskerville and transport them out of the realm. You will help him. So, I mean, um, so that's what the letter says. And it's famous partly because you could argue it's the first openly racist letter. So having had the first evidence of black people in Britain in the Roman Empire, you now have black people coming back and evidence of a racist response in that he was saying, get rid of the black people because, and I'm slightly shifting it, they're taking our jobs is basically the, the thing. So um, that's what an interpretation. I'm actually going on a bit too much. So I would li like to say, because this is something I would actually like people to say what you think of it. Um, if I hadn't been rambling so much, I would try and divide people into groups to discuss it because I think it's a very interesting document and there's quite a lot of things within it. But if anyone has any comments that they'd like to make on, uh, on what she's saying and why, um, I'd be interested to hear. Queen Elizabeth I. What's interesting I'm looking at is it's interesting to see who Edward Baines and Sir Thomas Baskerville are and what their relationship is with Queen Elizabeth I. <laughs> because, I mean, when she had this agreement with one of her staff, she loved them not too much about it, but she knew this one thing spite. Yes. Um, I think I absolutely agree with this, and I think there's, having been talking about Romans a lot, there's a famous Roman legal question, uh, which I've forgotten the Roman for, qui bono, I think, who benefits is the thing. So, uh, yes, so when you look at it, the first thing is to say, who is going to benefit from this? And it, it, that, so you can, I think, divide the rhetoric, if you like, which is the top paragraph, from the practical bit, which is the second paragraph, and then it's absolutely question right, right to ask who these people are and whose interests is what's going on in. Sorry, did you? No, no, that's okay. <laughs> um, so. Is there any evidence of racism in the Queen Elizabeth I? Well, I think it's, it's an, there's an interesting thing that's going on here. Firstly, the rhetoric, which is there are too many in the country, we've got to get rid of them all, we're being overrun. Um, and then the practical thing, which is there's 10 people I want you to get rid of. 
Well, I don't think even in those days, England's job market would have been overrun by 10 people. So it, it is a slightly odd thing. Um, I would, yes, I would call it proto-racist rather than racist, but I think, it, to me, it's interesting in that it shows a lot of the things that racists come up with today are already there. There's, um, yes, this kind of people, there's too many of them, um, and why? Because British population's growing and many people have no jobs and therefore live in po poverty. Uh, they, it's not they don't have jobs. It's certainly not my fault as the Queen or anything. It's the fault of, well, I don't know if it's the fault of these 10 black people who've come in the country, but of um, people who are, who are coming in. And I think that this is, um, it's interesting. As far as I know, incidentally, Edward Baines was a, not exactly a bounty hunter, but something like that, the sort of person who might capture people and have them so, this was a letter saying, help him. Thomas Baskerville was a, an explorer and an aristocrat who went out and um, had brought back black people. Now the question at this stage is already, what was their status? Um, were they enslaved people or not? And it was not always clear. It may seem weird looking back to say, you didn't always know whether people were enslaved or not, but actually there were, it wasn't always clear. Um, and it's, I just want, I don't necessarily want to leave this, so if people want to come back to it, even though we've only got five minutes left, um, I would, but I think it's interesting, there's a lot to say about this period, because it's one of the first where there's lots of written records which we've got. And for instance, this is um, uh, church records from London, um, and one of them, so this is from 1587, so the same sort of period, St. Botolph's Church, Aldgate, London, and it's a burial record. Um, it says, Domingo, a black Negro servant of um, William Winter, died of consumption at the age of 40. Um, so there's a couple of interesting things there, but one, he died of consumption, he was 40, he's registered as a servant. What, whether that means he was enslaved, it's not clear. But he's also in the church record with other people, so it's not, at other periods, slaves would be somewhere else, they wouldn't actually be on the, on the main record. Um, as someone who occasionally writes things, I'm not quite sure why it's necessary to say he's a black Negro, but, um, um, but that might have just been a general thing at the time. Um, but the point being that there are books now, people have been through these records and found that there were quite a lot of um, black people of various sorts who were arriving in, uh, in London in various, in various ways at this time. And, since we've really got to the end, I want to finish uh, with the forecast of what's coming next week. There. So, Sir John Hawkins, uh, another of um, Queen Elizabeth's favourites, um, and a cousin of Sir Francis Drake, um, in case you haven't heard of him, um, was one of the privateers. Now, at the time, Spain was the top European power, Spain and Portugal, but mainly Spain. Uh, and they had started the, um, discovered America, started the conquest of the Americas, and were, had started working the slave trade and were bringing back gold, which they were taking you know, from the various um, American peoples. Britain had none of this and didn't like the fact so um, Queen Elizabeth set up the privateers. Um, these are people who have been enormously romanticised in British he history. Walter Raleigh, um, Sir Francis Drake, and less famously John Hawkins. People don't always know what privateers means these days. It basically means pirates. 
They were licensed pirates who were told, we don't like the Spanish because it was at war with Spain, so you can pirate uh, Spanish ships, grab what they have, uh, and then as long as you give the queen a cut, um, you can become very rich, which they did. Now, one of the things that Hawkins did was capture a ship that was taking enslaved people uh, across the Atlantic. Um, he then took it on to its destination and sold the um, people and realised that there was an enormous profit in it. And he became Britain's first slave trader, something he was very pleased about. As you can see from his coat of arms, which has a chained enslaved person on the top, and his um, personal crest, which was of a tied up African. Um, so this is the beginning of a different phase, um, the phase of slavery of, and everything that goes with that, um, which is what I want to discuss next week. I think that there has been quite a lot of jumping about and talking about different things. I think each week after this, uh, things get more focused and more um, of a pattern because, because we covered a thousand years or so in this one and each one afterwards will be shorter. Also, we have much better records of everything from this period on. So I hope people have found that interesting. Um, I hope that you will be able to talk to other people and say that we can have more interesting discussions if more people come. Um, I, my, as I've said, my, I would like to do is sometimes break things up and say, as I've done in, in other classes, for instance, with that Queen Elizabeth's letter, say, look at it and what do you think? And finally, as I said, I was going to give you handouts. Let me just quickly give those and say, I hope to see you all next week. So thanks for coming.